Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Where is your joy? Who, look at your neighbor real quick. Look at your neighbor real quick. Be like, neighbor, who stole your coffee this morning? Neighbor, who cut you off in the drive through at McDonald's? Who stole your joy? Are we excited to be in God's house this morning? Can we just give the Lord a hand clap? We just sang that great is his faithfulness. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I look back and I see what the Lord has brought me through. And I have some excitement in my bones. Come on now. Leave alone that guy who touched Elisha's bones. I have some excitement in my bones. And I'm alive. Hallelujah. So I pray and I believe that this morning the Lord woke you up. You smell the coffee or tea or air, oxygen. If you have someone who farted, you smell that too. But you woke up and you were excited. You know, you were like, Lord, I am going into your house today. I will worship you. I will praise you. I will lift your name on high. So is someone excited with me this morning? I know it's cold out there, but it's going to be 38 degrees this week sometime. Hallelujah. That is short weather. Come on now. Said no Kenya never. Uh, but anywho. I digress. So my name is Steve. Excited to be with you in God's house this morning. Uh, on a good day, uh, Pastor and Grace, <clears throat> allow me to be part of the pastorate here at Lifebridge Church. Uh, and on, on other days, uh, I exist. I simply exist, you know. But no, uh, excited to be part of uh, what God is doing in, in this place here at Lifebridge Church. Just want to give honor to the leadership of Pastor Bill and Grace and for the amazing shepherds that they are to us. Uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, Jesus looked at some people with eyes of compassion and he felt sad because there were people uh, who operated, who lived as if they were uh, lost sheep, sheep without a shepherd. And we have the privilege and the honor of having two wonderful, anointed, spirit-filled, uh, amazing uh, shepherds in this house. So Pastor Bill and Grace, we honor you this morning. Uh, I also honor some other people who said that I can't mention them so they know themselves. We love you. Uh, and to my family uh, that is watching from uh, Kenya, East Africa, Africa, on the other side of the Indian Ocean, I honor you, Dad and Mom, this morning. So let, let us get this day started. I have eh, some time. Brace yourselves. We'll be here four hours later. You know, it's going to be amazing. Uh, but no, if it's your first, second, or third time, I promise you we will have you out of here in reasonably good time. Emphasis on reasonably. Uh, but no. So we have been going through these last couple of weeks, or actually months, uh, this wonderful series that Pastor Bill and Grace and even Rich shared with us about bold moves. And yes, the series ended last Sunday, if you were here, if you watched us online. However, I decided, you know, as a loving son, to supplement this wonderful series uh, and, and just talk about uh, something additional to this idea of bold moves. So turn with me either on the screens on your preferred cellular device or tablet, uh, if you have your physical Bible, hallelujah. Uh, turn with me to the book of First John chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. I know it sounds like so many verses. But we'll make it, hallelujah. The Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall read long verses and not grow weary, hallelujah. Uh, but so, 1 John chapter 4 says, uh, oh sorry, 1 John 4 verses 7 says, Dear friends, and I'm reading from the NLT, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Can I get an Amen. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. 
Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. I can say that all day long. Let me just say it again for emphasis. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Verses 18 in conclusion. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Some of your uh, versions say uh, casts out all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Let me just add on verse 19 on there. We love each other because he loved us first. So if you're one of those awesome note taker people... We bless the Lord for you. Uh, today's sermon title is God is Love. So again, we have been talking about this whole theme of, or this topic of bold moves in response to what God has done for us. And so we live out these bold moves. And we started with this whole aspect of prayer and fasting, which uh, was awesome. It was challenging in some days, but it was amazing. And we've seen already what God is doing as a result of us as a church, coming together, praying and fasting and seeking the Lord. And Pastor finished on a high note. Not that he was singing the note, but, you know, figuratively speaking. Uh, but he talked about standing. Now, after God has done all these things, what do we do? We stand. Amen. And we put on the full armor and we, and we go to battle, not, you know, you don't go wielding swords and knives and machetes and, you know, trying to cut the enemy. But, you know, going and living out boldly and, and representing the kingdom of God ready for whatever the enemy may throw at you. Hallelujah. But I wanted to focus on what I call a mic drop moment in the Bible. There are many mic drop moments in the Bible, by the way. It's just, not just one. But this is one of those just... Epic, for lack of a better word, epic mic drop moments. And so you're like, Steve, I follow you. However, what is a mic drop moment? I will start by saying what is not a mic drop moment. If you have the fortunate pleasure of being called Michael, if you happen to come into contact with this beautiful thing called gravity, or lack of it, and you fall flat on your face, or as pastor calls it, your blessed assurance if you fall on your back. That is not a mic drop moment. Insert laughter. <clears throat> what also is not, or uh, another thing that's, uh, not, that's uh, a mic drop moment is, and for the person running sound, do not be afraid, peace be with you. I will not literally drop the mic. But in essence, this whole theme of, of dropping the mic is uh, figuratively, I mean, literally, it's dropping a microphone. But figuratively, this whole idea of when you make such a profound statement, when you say something so uh, shattering, so to speak, when you say something that has so much vigor and excitement, when you make such a point, whether quietly or boldly, that the person receiving what you have to say you don't need to say anymore. You just leave it at that. After saying that phrase, after saying that sentence, after saying that word, that it, it shakes the atmosphere so much so that all you do is walk away and leave the mic at the expense of gravity. And so the Bible is full of these moments where certain phrases are said, certain things are said, certain stories are said that when after they are done being spoken, it's, you just have to sit there and as the, psalm, or as the psalmist reminds us, you just have to say la. You just have to sit there and pause and just chew on that. And so there's this mic drop moment that we've just read about. And it's really neat that the person saying this mic drop moment is a guy by the name of John. Hallelujah. How many Johns do we have in the house? That's a cool name. You're in the Bible. You should brag about it. Uh, just live up to the standard that's <clears throat> on there. Or greater. Hallelujah. And so John declares this statement that I, I can only imagine that 
when he wrote this, there was probably so much excitement in the room, he had to make a few laps. Hallelujah. There was so much joy when he wrote this. There was so much uh, excitement and, and vigor. There was just something. There was such great revelation when he said these words that I, I, if I was a fly on the wall, not that I want to be a little fly on the wall, but if I was a fly on the wall, if, if, if I was a speck of dust in his room that day, that when he wrote these words, I could only imagine what was going through his spirit, what was going through his mind, what, what pleasure he was experiencing when he wrote this. But he said, God is love. Let me just repeat that again. It needs to hit you in the face nicely. God is love. Think about that. And here's the cool thing, that John is not only talking about what God's love has done for us, as is the emphasis in most times, but he says that God's nature, God's character, God's essence, God's attribute is love itself. That the person of who God is, is love. He is the OEM. Original equipment manufacturer. He doesn't have to go to the aftermarket to go get this. He is love itself. If, there was, if you were looking in the dictionary of love and there was a word on there to describe what love is, the first answer should be God. That's how emphatic, that's how amazing this statement is. That John tells us, hey, yes, love one another. Yes, do all these things in response to love. But God is Love, and he says it twice if you are paying attention. And here's the funny thing, that the word love, not the funny thing, but the, the thing about this word love, you know, and it's uh, interesting that Valentine's Day was a week ago this Sunday. So hopefully for those of you who this is, you know, one of those big moments in your marriage, relationship, family, uh, that you uh, stepped up the ante so that, you know, next year you can take it to the next level, but I hope that it was a, it was a good time for, for all those involved. But see, this word love is both a noun and a verb. It's used to describe strong affection for another person, and equally in the same sentence, for pizza. That I can say, I love my wife, and then after I eat a lovely burrito, I can say, I love that burrito. That... We say we love our cars, we love our clothing. You know, it's, you know the English language is a beautiful language, right? Uh, for some of us, it came by ship or by plane. <clears throat> but the English language only barely scratches the surface. It, it, it doesn't do the word love justice. And so there's this other really cool language, Greek, yay. And so uh, in the Greek, they, they, they kind of go a little bit deeper. There's more nuance. You know, it's like, you know, have you ever had that cup of coffee that just took you to the next level? You know, there's coffee, and then there's that coffee, right? Or there's tea, and then there's that tea. And if you don't drink those two, uh, there's water, that water that just took you to the next level. Uh, but like in, in the Greek here, uh, the, the, this word love is, is, is kind of taken to, to a different level. And so in the Bible, there are, uh, if you've studied uh, Greek and Hebrew and all this fun languages that really help open up and help you understand the scriptures a lot more. Uh, in the Greek, uh, there are three words in the Greek that are used to describe love in the Bible. The fourth one is not really directly spoken about, but it's kind of hinted at. But here are those uh, four words. So today, when you're done, when you walk out of that room, you can, you know, just start dropping words in, in Greek about love. And people are like, what are you talking about? And be like, Steve said, I have to use at least the challenge for this week. Use at least one of these Greek words in your vocabulary as you converse with people. The first one is phileo. And it means affectionate friendship. Think about, uh, you know, Jonathan and David. They had this affectionate friendship. Think about the relationship between Jesus and Lazarus. There's this affectionate friendship. This brotherly love, right? Or sisterly love. This, this deep affectionate friendship. And then there's the word eros, which is romantic or sexual love. 
They're storge. I, love, I just love how that, you know, storge. You know, it's just so cool. Uh, this love of family, right? Uh, relationships between parents and their siblings or between s- siblings. This, this family love. And then uh, the la- last but not least, this, this beautiful word. Perhaps you've heard it pronounced or said before. Agape. Coming from the word agapeo. Man, the, the Greeks are just cool like that, you know. Agape. And what does agape mean? It means God's unconditional love. God's sacrificial love. This love in action. There's emphasis about that. It's not just love for the sake of giggles and warm and fuzzies. It's a love that is in action. And that's what uh, John, the Apostle John, is talking to us about today. This agape love of God that's unconditional, sacrificial. It's love in action. And therefore, I believe the boldest move that God has shown us is that he loves us. Yes, he sent his son to die for you. Yes, he moves mountains on your behalf. But the thing that prompted him to do that was he loves us. Because of his love, he gave Think about John 3.16. You can probably uh, say it in like five different languages. You know, you just, it just rolls off your tongue. If you've been in the church world for, for a bit, you've heard this word. For God so loved that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have life eternal, right? But let's look at that. For God so loved first, then second he gave. Light bulb moment, huh? You're like, man, that's deep, right? This whole idea of God loving us first. Because it's in his nature, he can pour out this love to us. So what image comes to mind when you think of God's love? I'm going to give you two seconds. When you think about God's love, what's the first image that comes to mind? For some of us, maybe it's, you know, that symbol of Jesus on the cross. The epitome of God's love. Perhaps you think about the time you were going through some difficult seasons and the love of God just carried you through that season. For some of us, maybe when you sing, you know, there's just such depth and emotion that you can't explain in words when you think of God's love. But for me, one of the first images that comes to mind when I think about God's love is this picture of a tempest enveloping around me. And you're like, see, what's a tempest? Basically, it's, think of it like a violent storm. And it's not that God is coming at you to destroy you with his love, but this whole idea of a furious love Not in anger, not in retribution or judgment, but this overwhelming love, this enveloping love, this engulfing love. This love that is beyond anything I can fathom physically, that just overshadows me, it blankets over you, it permeates through what we deal with in everyday life. It's so strong that It unveils veiled minds and eyes. And it's so strong that it softens heart and hearts. This love, that's like a tempest. And in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19, Paul makes a really profound prayer for the church of Ephesus. He prays for them that God would grant them the power to understand how wide, how long, how deep, and how high the love of God is. Just think about that for a second. That Paul came to a place in his relationship with God where he desired so much so that others would get to experience what he had experienced. I remind you that this was a man who had made it his life's ambition to persecute the church. This was a very smart Man, this was a man who knew the word of God. He had studied under the best of them. But then he has this encounter with God on his way to Damascus. This profound encounter that forever changed his life. And years later here now he's talking, he's writing letters to all these churches. 
and he gets to a place where it's like church of Ephesus I pray that the Lord will grant you the power to begin to understand to begin to just to have this deep revelation of how wide how long how deep how high is God's love for you and he continues to say I know that you can't fully understand it but man, when that revelation, when you finally begin to see that picture in 8K, you know, there used to be days when 1080p was it. Now there's 4K, which is standard. And then they have the audacity to make 8K. And they'll probably be like 16K and 24K, all these Ks. But just the clarity this, that you come to a place in your walk with Christ when you have this deep and profound revelation of how much he loves you. And I love worship songs that talk about God's love. It just begins to help you kind of understand what that means. And there's a song that came out a couple years ago called How He Loves. We have sang it uh, many a times on this platform, uh, in this sanctuary, in, in perhaps in our homes as we are uh, working on chores or driving. It's a song that was made uh, popular by David, uh, David Carter Band, also known as DCB. Uh, and then but the person who wrote this song, his name is John McMillan. And I love the first couple of lines in this song. And the song says, he is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane and I am a tree. Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. What a powerful picture. That, you know, the last thing you think of a hurricane is like, man, I can't wait for this hurricane to come and knock me out. No one says that. You know, you don't wake up and say, I cannot wait for that hurricane to come and just knock out my house. You know, just destroy all this property. But no, he, he, he gives us this paradox, this, this picture of the love of God like a hurricane. And we are that tree not being uh, destroyed, but being taken up. In this furious love, in this, uh, in this tempest, in this overwhelming, uh, there are not enough words to explain what I'm trying to say this morning. This love of God that just, you know, you're abandoning, you're just taking it all in. And not to break you, but to grow you, to take you deeper. To take you deeper. This, this idea of intimacy and relationship and fellowship with he who is love itself. And the neat thing about God's love is it's not like the bank. God doesn't, you know, rent love to you. He's not like, okay, here's the principle of love, the amount of love that I'll give you. Uh, in 36 months, I expect certain payments of love returned to me. And then if you uh, default on this loan of love, you know, there'll be uh, hell and, you know, all this other stuff. And, you know, eternal da or damnation and all these other things. No. That this love of God is poured out constantly. It's, it's, it's poured out upon us. We sing, great is your faithfulness. Uh, your mercies are new every morning. You know, we think about this love that is constantly poured on us. Because God is love, he has given us his love. Because he doesn't have to go mine for love. He doesn't have to go borrow love to give you love. It's free. He has unlimited resources that you can know. You can wake up knowing every single day that the love of God is ready for you. It's available for you. And so what is our response? God has already done his part. He's made the bold move to love us. What is our response? Number one, to accept his love. You're like, Steve, that's simple. No, it's not. Because many times, remember that the love of God is a free gift, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. If the verse stopped there, then we'd be in trouble. But it continues and tells you, here's, what you, here's where you come in, that you believe that whoever believes, whoever accepts, whoever comes to a place where they say, yes, Lord, I am ready to receive your love and make it personal. I am making a choice. I am taking a stand. 
The first response when God loves us is to accept his love. It's a gift. That's why Jesus can say it towards the end of Revelation that behold, I knock on the door. And whoever hears my voice, what do you do? You open it. You welcome him. He comes and sits with you. And in the same way, our first response should be to accept his love. That's not enough. After you accept his love, you need to abide in his love. What does abide mean? It means you dwell in that love, right? We read in uh, 1 John again there, verses 16, uh, 416, where he says, We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. That's abiding like it has never been explained before. We abide in his love. And then it doesn't stop there. You know, you don't just, you know, abide in his love and, you know, you sing kumbaya all day and you forget about everyone else. No, the love of God, remember, is a love in action. This word agape. And so it means that we love others as well. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. What manner of love is this? And it's not just kind of sort of given to you. It's bestowed upon you. It is given with pleasure. It is given with desire. It is given with trust. It is given with uh, anticipation that the love of God is not just kind of thrown at you. It's given with intention that he, lo- he bestows upon you. It is stewarded over you. And not only that, it is given to you so you can share with others. And Jesus just puts it in perspective. See, the beauty about, what, about the, one of the characters of who God is is he is love. He gives us his love, and then he shows us how to walk out that love. He sent his son, Jesus, to literally show you how to walk and live out that love step by step. There is this beautiful word called Shema. It means to listen. In some cases, to listen and obey. In Judaism, they pray two prayers primarily in the morning and in the evening. And Jesus quoting in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, he's quoting, he's, asked, he's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. But Jesus is having a really lovely, uplifting conversation with the religious leaders of that day. You know, he had so many uplifting conversations with those leaders. I'm joking. Uh, but yes, he was trying to uplift them, yes. But they usually, uh, excuse the term, they came at him the wrong way. Does that make sense? Uh, So here's a religious leader there uh, trying to ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment, right? They know that uh, coming from uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, that they knew there were these ten commandments. And then on top of that, the religious leaders uh, had added a few, a lot uh, of sub-laws under that. Uh, And so they're asking Jesus, what are the greatest commandments, and I can only imagine Jesus looking at this, uh, these religious leaders with eyes of love and thinking, I know what you're trying to do, but, but let, me, let me awaken you to a new reality. And he says this, giving them context. He says, Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. That's another mic drop moment just right there. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mic drop, mic drop, mic drop, mic drop. Let's go home. He establishes it to them. He gives them context and in the same time he quickens them. He tells them, you know and I know. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Let's establish that right now. 
You're not trying to find love from multiple sources. There is one God, three expressions. The Lord is one. And then he quickens them and he says, and here is your responsibility. You and I shall love the Lord your God with all, not some of your heart. See, God is a full-time God. He doesn't love you on a good day. He doesn't need three shots of espresso to love you. After you're done throwing your tantrums, he's not like, man, I'm going to go walk away and I'll come back and then I'll maybe think about loving you. No, he has already given us his love. He's already pouring it out. And he says in response, love me with everything you have, with every aspect of your fiber, with your body, with your soul, and with your spirit. Love me. Respond. And not in a condemning way, but he invites us into relationship with him. And he says, equally important, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, that's a hard part to do. For example, some of you have neighbors you really like. You know, you see them, you wave at them, you celebrate them. You know, if it was not for COVID, you'd probably hang out a lot more than uh, you, you would or you have done in the last year or so. But they're just people in your life that you don't have to think long and hard. You know, warm fuzzies, you know, you have the warm fuzzies. You have a desire to know them. You love them. You know, you care about them. And so it's easy to interact with them. And then there are those neighbors. You know those neighbors. Every time you see them, there's an indignation in your spirit. You're like, I remember that one time my dog crossed the yard and by mistake, and instead of lovingly telling me, you decided animal control should be involved in this transaction. Or you have that neighbor. It snowed on Tuesday like there was no tomorrow. I shovel that snow. Truly, I say unto you, it was a miserable experience. Uh, and so you are out there, you know, your snowblower, maybe, or you haven't bought one yet. Uh, you know, you're having troubles that day. You are out there suffering for the kingdom. You are shoveling that snow. And then the guy next door just snowblower, zing, they're done. They just leave you suffering there. There's that neighbor. You know them. You have that neighbor. You invited them over. You were brave enough to invite them for dinner in the midst of COVID. There were leftovers. The dinner was delicious. You gave them your Tupperware. And they have not returned it three months later. Lord, have mercy. You know those neighbors. But no, why did Jesus say equally important love your neighbor as you love yourself? Because God desires that we reflect that same love he's so richly given us. And again, remember in that in, in Greek there are those four different forms of love primarily. I know there are subcategories if you really want to do the research. But... When Jesus said, love your enemies, he wasn't saying, have warm fuzzies about your enemies. You know, he wasn't saying, man, go fall in love with your enemy. No. He was saying, serve them, right? If you see their ox hanging out three miles down the road, bring the ox back to them. You know, if uh, you took their Tupperware and you, you know, didn't wash it, you should probably wash it before you take it back. Uh, if someone's going through a tough time, encourage them, right? Love your neighbor as you have been loved. And here's the thing that we, we like to say this so much so, right? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. You know, fireworks and all that stuff. It's awesome. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You get a sticker. You get a sticker. You all get stickers. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You've been anointed. But there's a really crucial part that's said in that. And he says... Love your neighbor as yourself, to quote Justin Bieber. There is a song where he says, baby, you should love yourself. And so the, and he borrowed that from the Bible. We just read it. Do you love yourself? Do you love yourself? Because how are you going to love your neighbor if you don't love yourself? Where are you going to get the love from? You know, it's going to magically wake up and there'll be love everywhere. It comes from that relationship with God, right? 
as you abide in God, as you respond to his love, as you allow him to fill up your love tank, then you can love others. But you have to love yourself. In this day and age, there are way too many people who do not love themselves. And there are people in this room who minister in some really uh, interesting places. And they've seen what happens when people don't love themselves. And there's a world that is running on love tanks that are empty. And they're waiting for you and I to begin to pour out that same love that's been given to us. So Jesus is saying, in essence, because God is love, I am loved, I can love, and I will love. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. I truly believe that the opposite of love is not hate. You're like, Steve, what school did you go to? A good one. I paid attention in English class. The opposite of love is fear. And we see in our world what happens when people are afraid. Hatred comes from fear, right? We see in our world what fear has done. In history, in present, and probably in the future, That fear just, it separates, it destroys, it crushes. But look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, got some good news for you. Shalom. Just say that with oomph. Shalom, peace be with you. Because God's perfect love casts out all fear. Not some fear. Not 99% of all fear situations. Perfect love casts out all fear. In the book of, uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy, where uh, Timothy, or Paul is speaking to Timothy and he says, you know, fan into flame that gift that was given upon you by the laying on of hands. And he says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And a sound mind. That we see what the love of God does. It breaks those barriers that fear creates. It fills those holes. It, tra- it, it opens up veiled minds and softens hardened hearts. And the love of God compels us to obey. Because consistent obedience is how we live out God's love for us. Jesus told his disciples numerous times, if you love me, obey. In essence, what? Do likewise. As I have shown you, do the same. Obey. If you love me, obey. Even in the book of Deuteronomy, when uh, Moses was telling this uh, Shema to the nation of Israel, it was in regarding to obeying the commands of the Lord. Remember, the agape love is a love in action. It's not a passive love. It's not just warm fuzzies. That it's a love that prompts us to do something. A love that says, yes, I can see how fear is taking all control of our world. But it says, I know that greater is he that is in me. Come on now. That he who is in the world. This love that says, I can do All things through who? Christ who strengthens me. This love that says we put our trust in our God and therefore we will not be shaken. This love that tells us to rise up and live boldly because we know who God is. This love that prompts consistent obedience. And so in closing... As a, corp- as a corporate body, as a church body, and as individuals, the Bible shows us different uh, expressions in how love is to be carried out. And there is a case study, if, we, if, you, if uh, we may call it that, about a church in the book of Revelations and how they handled 
this idea, this concept, this truth, this revelation about God's love. And I believe it's an example to us and in the same breath a warning to us. And I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. There's just a word, a couple of words in there that are used that I really bring, I really believe bring the point home. And here's John again talking about this whole idea of love. John must have really liked talking about love. I mean, he is also famously known as the disciple who Jesus loved. And I think it wasn't just for him trying to be a smart aleck. I really think he, he understood. He had a revelation of God's love. And so here's John speaking to the church of Ephesus or writing a letter to the church of Ephesus as the Lord Jesus instructed him to speak. He says, I know all that you've done for me. What a statement. I know all that you've done for me. You have worked hard and persevered. I know that you don't tolerate evil. You have tested those who claimed to be apostles and proved they are not, for they were imposters. I also know how you have bravely endured trials and persecutions because of my name, yet you have not become discouraged. I mean, if that was said about you, you would have a worldwide ministry. You'd be traveling right now. You'd have buses. says, the Lord said to me, I know all that you've done for me. You know, you would, if it was, if it was some, uh, some, some Christians in our day and age, I mean, you, you, if you had what we call a CV, a curriculum vitae, resume, um, that you would be glowing. It would say, yes, they've got it. They've, hold, they've held on to Jesus. The gospel is at work in their lives. They're doing it. They are standing strong. They're making bold moves, Pastor. And, the, and they are standing strong and putting on the full armor. And they're fighting uh, the temptations of the enemy. They don't tolerate evil. They don't play around with the things of this world. Come on. Uh, this church, they've got it together. Their worship songs are selling out every single day. They, they know what they're talking about. This church has kept pastors and preachers and apostles and, and church leaders accountable. They don't play around with false prophets. They don't uh, allow the word of God to be watered down or, or all these different things. This church, as they say, is on point. But then the Bible continues. And Jesus speaking to the church of Ephesus says, but I have this against you. Uh-oh. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. I need to read that again. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Think about how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place of influence if you do not repent. Although to your credit, you despise the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also despise. These are other false teachers of that time. The one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is saying now to all the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give access to feast on the fruit of the tree of life that is found in the paradise of God. That is scary, church. That you can do all those things for God in the name of being a Christian. You can see miracles, signs, and wonders take place. You can be the best vocalist there can be. I mean, you can walk and your shadow can heal people because of how great the anointing of God is on your life. You can see millions and billions of people 
touched by the presence of God. But there is a very profound and strict warning in there. That because God is love, you and I have to keep him first. And not just keep him first, but he has to be our first love. And I like how the Passion Translation puts it. Passionate love. A love that is alive and well. A love that overflows. A love that is not afraid. A love that desires to abide before the OEM all day long. 24-7, 365. No subscription needed. A love that is so pure that nothing can separate you from the love of God. A love that as a husband makes you look at your wife with pure eyes and, and like you've never seen her before. That gives you joy in your inner being. That when you look at your children, you begin to dance a little bit. Come on now. A love that sees a world that is broken and says, God, it cannot stop here. A love that says, yes, Lord, I will do everything that I need to do. I will lay down. No sacrifice is too big as long as I abide in your love. A love that says, God, you made the boldest move. Now the ball is in my court. And you don't leave me to play the game by myself. You coach me. Come on now. You coach me every single day. Your Holy Spirit lives in me. And reminds me and empowers me and walks with me to love as you have loved me that when I look in the mirror I don't have to cry when I look in the mirror I don't have to be afraid when I look in the mirror I don't have to be depressed because I know him who loves me that God is love and so church I leave you with these words Number one, abide in God's passionate love. In God's passionate love. And in response, love God passionately. And as you, as you love others, co compassionately. Abide in God's passionate love. Love God passionately as you love others compassionately. For God is love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. You need to memorize that this week. God is love. And those who live in love, live in God, and God lives in them. So this morning, I don't know if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. This morning, I don't know how long you've been safe for, and maybe you look at your life and you say, you know what, Steve, maybe God is not the first love. Pizza and a few other things have taken his place. Steve, I've never really experienced God's love this morning. I'm not sure what that is, but I am hungry for something more. Steve, when I look at the mirror every morning, I don't see God's love. I see my mistakes. I see my shortcomings. I see all the things that the world says I am. But today the Lord says he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. So church, if you want to make the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as your first response, remember accepting His love. I just want to pray with you. And for those of you perhaps who've walked with Jesus for a little while, for a long while, if you're saying, you know what, I need to repent and lay some things down today, I want to pray with you too. And then I want to finish out and pray that the Lord will saturate us so much with his love that we cannot contain it and that we will walk out of those doors this week in 38 degree weather with our shorts on and declare his love as God opens up those opportunities. Shall we pray? Everlasting Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you this morning. 
God, we thank you for you are love. You are love in action. We don't have to go searching for anything else that we can find all that love is in you. And God, we pray with those who don't know you, who are perhaps at a place in their lives who are saying, Lord Jesus, I want a relationship with you. I want to live this love and walk it out. I want to receive this love. God, I pray that you would hear their cry and soften any hardened hearts. Remove the veils from their minds and their eyes and help them to fully and totally surrender to you. God, I pray for those who have been walking with you for a while, for a season, four seasons. And perhaps like the church of Ephesus, they have done some great things for the kingdom, but they are, but Lord, they recognize that you are not their first passionate love. God, I pray, forgive us for where we have allowed anything to take your place in the center of our lives. Have mercy on us, O God, create in us a clean heart and renew a right and contrite spirit within us. Lord, we pray, let your love saturate us and may we abide. May we learn to abide. May we learn to abide. May we learn to abide in your love. God, we pray that as a church body, as we rise up to what you have called us to be, as we take those bold moves every single day, God, I pray that Lafridge will be known as a church that loves you that people will walk in through our doors and encounter your love as we spend time with our families as we spend time with our friends as we spend time with our co-workers as we go about our day-to-day -day activities lord may your love shine forth in everything that we do god we pray that let leftwich church be known in the books of history as a church that lived out your agape love that yes, Lord, as we live out brotherly love, as we live out, as we live out strogay love, and for those in marriage romantic relationships, as we live out that eros love, that God, may your agape be the foundation that we live out of, God. For you are love. Thank you, God, for loving on us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that you will continue to love us. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.